And welcome into a new hour of CBS Sports HQ. Amanda Guerra with you. It was a crazy week in College 5 and College Football. Six top 15 teams losing four in the top 10. And that is setting up for a wild week six, including an SEC on CBS doubleheader. We have an SEC doubleheader on CBS this Saturday, beginning with number two Georgia traveling to Auburn to take on the 18th ranked Tigers. It's no secret how Kirby Smart and his dogs have been getting it done this season. They not only have the best defense in the country, they're on pace to be historically great. Through five games, they're allowing fewer than five points per game. And the two touchdowns they've given up both came in garbage time and a couple of blowouts. And while they haven't allowed a single point over the last two games, they can score in all three phases. We block it in the end zone. Ball is bouncing. We're diving on it. We got it. Block punt. Touchdown dogs. But Auburn is feeling good about itself as well after beating LSU in Death Valley. Though head coach Brian Harson knows this is a much different test. And his quarterback Bo Nix is going to need to play the game of his life in the Deep South's oldest rivalry. In some trouble. They lose one man. Now floats it out. He has a man open. Looks downfield. Still on his feet. Still on his feet to the end zone. Touchdown, Auburn! Auburn and Georgia have played each other since 1892. And it's a rivalry Georgia has owned of late, winning 13 of the last 16. But crazier things have happened. A miracle in turned to hair! A miracle in turned to hair! Auburn looking for some more of that magic, while Georgia just needs to keep doing what they've been doing. It's number two at number 18, Saturday afternoon, 3.30, on CBS. So that is your SEC on CBS doubleheader. We are very excited for it. Both Georgia, Alabama seemingly pulling away from the rest of the nation. They are both favored by double digits in their games this week. Over the next hour, we will give you picks in those games along with other ranked games as well. Welcome in to this hour of CBS Sports HQ. Looking ahead to week six. By the way, in college football, Amanda Guerra, Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell. All right, let's jump into it. We got Georgia at Auburn. Of course, Georgia shutting out Arkansas 37 nothing that last game. They're favored by 14 and a half against Auburn. The total here is 46. Brady, we'll start with your play. It's a big line, and I kind of thought last week was a big line, too. And then Georgia just laid the <laughs> hammer down, and they didn't even need JT Daniels, right? They had Stetson Bennett, uh, JT Daniels dealing with an oblique or lat issue, so, so didn't end up going for this one. What that revealed, though, was Georgia's getting their mojo back in the run game. All right, that, that, that nasty rushing attack started to show up. That sort of developed because it hasn't been quite the same as what we're accustomed to seeing. But how about that defense pitching a shutout, holding Arkansas to only 75 rushing yards, really kind of flexing on them. And that's been the M.O. for Auburn this year. I know they had a good win last week versus LSU, but the reality is Bo Nix has been inconsistent. You know, he's never really taken a step that we've been hoping for. And they rely heavily on the on that tandem of backs they have in the backfield, but no one's doing that against Georgia. So it's a big line. I hate the hook. I'm laying it though, Danny, and I'm taking the under in this one. Uh, we are in agreement on one of these. <laughs> I agree with you. It's going to be lower scoring. I'm going to go ahead and take Auburn here and the 14 and a half because of that hook. If it goes under any one or two touchdowns, I would be all over Georgia lay the points. But I think that this Auburn team with Bo Nix maybe finally getting that big moment that kind of just lets him breathe a sigh of relief. TJ Finley came in the second quarter. They were still thinking about benching him. And then all of a sudden he has this miraculous play that everyone's talking about. I also think. Can I ask you about that play? Does, yeah. does it happen versus Georgia's defense? I, it might. <laughs> so, here's, so here's what happens. I think a quarterback like Bo Nix who can run around a little bit can at least buy some time, which no one's been able to do to get some plays late in a game. Here's why I really like the under though. We always, we were talking about Georgia's defense. They're awesome. They're number one in the SEC versus the rush. You know who's number two? Auburn. Yep. I think Auburn could have some success and eventually somebody's gonna have to step up and throw the football. You can't rush it 56 times is what Georgia did against Arkansas. They're gonna have to throw the football. I'm starting to worry about, and it won't matter during the regular season. It'll matter when they're playing Alabama in the SEC championship game. JT Daniels has to step up, start, start becoming the man for this offense. And he's been banged up, the oblique early, then it's the lat. lat you know, it was, took him a while to come back from the ACL. That's why he wasn't available last year. I need that offense. You have to be balanced in order not to run the table with the rest of the remaining schedule, but to beat Alabama to win a national championship, sure. which is their only goal. They need to show that. In this game, 
I do wonder if Auburn could make them have to throw the football more, and I still don't know if JT Daniels or Stetson Bennett can get in this aerial attack. That's why I love the under in this game, but I'm going to go ahead and take the points. Auburn's defense has been better against the run, though, than they have the pass. It's, yes. That kind of plays right into their weakness, if that's the case, but I've got faith in them, honestly. I, look, you said it best, Amanda. It's Alabama, it's Georgia. They're on a collision course for the SEC championship game, and that might very well be the best game we see all year, including the college football playoff, if the loser of that game is not a part of the college football playoff at the end of the year. Well, let's look at the other one of those teams, Alabama at Texas A&M. Um, since A&M entered the SEC and Johnny Manziel, Alabama has not lost to Texas A&M. They're the big favorite in this one, 17 and a half. The total here is 46. Danny, what do you like in this game? So uh, six out of the last eight matchups between these two, Bama has scored 40 plus points. They're winning by around 17 points a game. And that was when Texas A&M felt like they were closing the gap. Losing, uh, Losing their starting quarterback Ellen was Mon. devastating uh, when they had to make the change to Zach Calzada. Yep. Haynes King was the guy. And, and they have lost any semblance of an offense. I mean, in their offensive line, which was struggling and was a question mark coming in the season, they have been exposed. They had under 300 yards of offense last week against Mississippi State. I think they're going to struggle to move the ball in this one. So I like Bama in this one. I like Bama big in College Station. And I actually like the over in this one because of Alabama's explosive offense. I wonder, this was a game everybody had circled, potential upset for Alabama. I don't know where Texas A&M is mentally right now. If they feel sorry for themselves at all, they will get blown out and it won't even be close. But I do think you could see a backdoor cover, either another Alabama touchdown or a late Texas A&M score that will get you that over. So I like Alabama in the over. I like Alabama in the over as well. We're in lock unity here. You know, I think last week one of the things that displayed itself was just Texas A&M's inability really to stop the passing attack of Mississippi State. And if you had trouble versus Mississippi State, you're going to have a lot of trouble with Alabama and Bryce Young the way he's looked at, looked at so far this year. So uh, that doesn't look good for them. Offensively, they struggled to really put, it, able to put up points. Kind of holding that against them. History would tell you, go ahead and lay the points with Bama here. I just think this is one of those games that Nick Saban's not going to let his foot off the gas. He's not going to let his team get too high on themselves after beating Ole Miss in a handily fashion. I think they understand they're in the SEC West. It's a tough track to get there, a tough road to get the SEC championship game. They're going to keep burying opponents right now. So love the over, love land the points here with Alabama because I don't know how much Texas A&M is going to score in this one. Lock and unity there. Uh, last week, you guys had nine. I don't believe there was many this week. We'll find Where's out. The at the end. Where's the confetti? We've got to hold off. we got to right. hold off to the end. Uh, let's talk about this next game. Brady, you're actually going to be able to go to this game yep. in person. We get number four, Penn State, at number three, Iowa. Iowa jumping Penn State in the rankings last week. Iowa favored by two. Uh, Chris Hassel on set, huge Iowa fan, said – he, he would take the points with Penn State in this one. What do you Whoa. think, Brady? I, I'm with them on that, too. And I think the reason being is Penn State's a little more battle-tested. Not that Iowa hasn't played a good schedule so far. They have. I've just seen more from Penn State, I think, so far. And, and that win versus Wisconsin doesn't look, doesn't look as good right now. That's still a nasty defense to go up against where Sean Clifford was challenged as the quarterback for Penn State. So I think they, they showed something there. They showed something versus Auburn getting a win there. They shut out Indiana last week. This Penn State team's for real. I mean, we kind of forget. They had their third offensive coordinator, and they've got better and better and better offensively. Jahan Dotson might be one of the best, if not the best, wide receiver in college football. And it's going to be a challenge. Look, this Iowa secondary has been stingy. They lead the Big Ten in interceptions. Uh, they're one of the better scoring defenses, but both defenses can really make that claim. The tilt in this case, to me, is the big playability of Penn State versus an Iowa offense that hasn't necessarily had to, right? You got Riley Moss picking off balls, taking them to the end zone. But they're going to have to be in this one in my mind. So, uh, look, I think this is going to be a low-scoring game. That's probably the only spot where you and I agree, Danny. But I've got Penn State, man. Sean Clifford was talking that talk. He's walking that walk right now. So, I've been fading our guy Chris Hassel all year long. <laughs> except against Indiana. I did like him against Indiana. But then when I look at this matchup, I see it. I think Penn State's more athletic. I think they have more top-tier ten, ta uh, top -tier talent. Yeah. I give the edge to Sean Clifford yeah. over Spencer Petras. Where are we going? But... I'm telling you, these Hawkeyes, oh, man. this oh, defense, no. the defense is playing lights out football. It's at home. They've won 11 straight. They're 9-2 and two against the spread. I'm going to go with the Hawkeyes, which hopefully I don't throw the jinx at them for our boy Hassel spot right here. But I do. I look at them, and I just, they figure out a way to do it. The defense, 15 takeaways, 12 interceptions. I get six of them were against Maryland last Friday night, which was pretty phenomenal. And you can start padding the stats with a game like that. 
but they are. They're playing with a lot of confidence. Bill Parker, the defensive coordinator, has done an outstanding job. He puts his guys in the right place at the right time, and they make the plays when the opportunity is there. I'm going to go ahead and lay the points with Iowa. But we, I love the under in this one. I think it's going to be gross. I think it's going to be disgusting. It's just, it's going to be perfect. Especially these noon games. <laughs> they have all had these ugly feels. Well, this is going to be, oh, this this be a little, it's a four Oh, even o'clock. better. And then even better. I get all the kids waving. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, that's better. No, yeah. It's Ooh. one of the most, it's what, Kinnick? Oh, my God. It's a okay. great, it's a great tradition. Yeah. It's an emotional, emotional thing. Uh, 41 and a half, though, is the over. I don't care. Are we both like Put it at 35 and a like, half. I actually so think I like taking the two points at Penn State better than I do the under, even though everything oh. tells you this should be a low scoring game. I wouldn't game sweat it point. if it was a 31 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> this, both two, these quarterbacks 10, 7, don't really scare 1960? you. Yes, pretty much. Uh, absolutely. I have beef with you right now. You've been fading Chris Hassel up until Not this till point. Now. You've yep. been fading Amanda Guerra up until this <laughs> point and Oklahoma. Uh, big uh, one. Oh, boy. I know. Big and it keeps happening. It's been winning for me, though, too. <laughs> Apparently not. Okay, I'm yeah. not going to argue about that. We'll see about this one. Uh, Oklahoma, Texas, technically at Texas, in Dallas, Red River rivalry, Red River shootout, no matter what you want to call it. Uh, OU favored in this one just by three and a half. The total here, 63 and a half. No, I'm going to start with Brady because I'm, I'm mad at you right now, Danny. Brady, go ahead. I, look, I think these are two pretty even teams for the most part. And Texas is a different offense now with Casey Thompson, a dual threat quarterback since he's taken over. They put up as much points as anyone in college football. I think their defense is starting to come around too with Pete Kukowski now calling the defense. And Oklahoma, I still have some concerns about their ability to create big plays, but you know what's gone over the radar? They can't run the football as well. They're not blocking as well up front. That offensive line hasn't been as dominant as it has in the past. So I hate the hook here because I think these teams are really even. If it was three or less, I'd probably lay the points with Oklahoma. But because we're sitting at three and a half and anything more than that, I'm on the side of Texas here. I do think it'll be a high scoring game, though. I like the over of 63 and a half in this one. There's going to be fireworks. It's a great atmosphere. The field's divided at the 50. I've been there, done that. It's an awesome time. So high scoring Big 12 football in this one for me. Talk to me, Brady. Talk to me. I am with you on the Longhorn. Sorry, man, but right, Oklahoma. I'm, I'm so Spence, used to it. I know, I know, but it's been winning for me. Spencer Rattler, 88% uh, completion percentage, his highest to date in a game uh, last week, but they just they haven't been very Oklahoma-ish yet. The best part about this, Amanda, AG, is that they've been winning. Last year they were struggling and they had lost two games. That's a great news, like their fans are getting restless. They're undefeated, which is awesome. I still think Texas is a viable threat, rivalry game. I think it's gonna be close. I think it's a field goal type game. So I'm gonna take Texas. The only thing I disagree with Brady on, 63 and a half. I know these games can get wild. It's called the Red River Shootout. Like it's gonna be wild. I just have a feeling you could see a healthy dose of Bijan Robinson, maybe trying to control the game a little bit more. But what's and but with Oklahoma's offense being only to throw the football, I haven't seen them put up big performances in the air yet. So I'm kind of trying to follow that trend to take the under. I worry about with them being so closely matched, this being an overtime game. Like that, yeah. that, that's yes. what scares me yeah, too. Was in play here because. Both these teams can score, but if it does tend to be a little bit low scoring, I hope so. We, they, end up, they end up going into overtime tied at 24 apiece. The next thing you know, they go into multiple overtimes. <laughs> yeah, which, which has happened. That yep. was my yeah. very first OU Texas when I was nine years old went into overtime. Oh, um, I know. That. Very sweet. How about that? Very Young AG. Very nice. Y'all's I'm grown up now. Livid with both of you guys. Y'all's All right, up. let's recap their picks. Taking a look at this. We had one lock unity. That was Alabama and the over for both of them. Uh, they do agree on the under when it comes to Penn State at Iowa, but on opposite sides when it comes to the teams there. And then both taking to Texas with the three and a half there. Danny going with the under, saying he's not been that impressed by the Sooners' offense so far. Coming up, so what did we learn about Arkansas after they were shut out by Georgia, and how will they fare against Ole Miss? We'll take a look at that and the rest of the SEC ranked games next. Welcome back into CBS Sports HQ, getting you ready for week six in college football. So we've got the doubleheader of the SEC on CBS this week. We gave you those picks. We're going to take a look at the rest of the ranked games, a couple of crucial matchups here, including Arkansas at Ole Miss. Both of those teams getting their first loss of the season last week. Uh, we'll see what the guys think about those teams going head to head. Welcome back in Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell here. So we get number 13, Arkansas at number 17, Ole Miss. Uh, as I mentioned, both teams getting their first loss of the season. I feel like Arkansas was exposed. Ole Miss favored by home, oh, excuse me, favored at home here by six and a half. The total 66 
Danny, what's your play in this game? I think you can make the case that both Arkansas and Ole Miss were exposed somewhat, but like, were they legit? Ole Miss didn't play anyone. No. Ole Miss went in that game off a of bind. They didn't play anyone. Uh, and I guarantee you won't hear Lane Kiffin talk about any popcorn this weekend. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. That. That's where you're wrong. Oh, you think you he's going to get your right popcorn back? ready for this <laughs> week because right. he's going to open up now. And right. He's going to expose that Arkansas defense. 21 points they scored against Alabama was the lowest in the Lane Kiffin era. I do think they'll get back, track on, uh, back on track versus Arkansas. I'm going to go ahead and lay the points here. Arkansas, I don't trust their passing game. I think Ole Miss will be able to put up some points. I think they're going to try to run it, which they probably will have some success against Ole Miss's defense running the football. But this is one of the better offensive minds. I am more of a believer, I think, than you are, Brady, in Ole Miss and their ability to move the football. Matt Corral probably knocked out of the Heisman race, although it wasn't on him, the fact that they got uh, pushed around against Alabama. He's still flawless on the year with zero interceptions. I just think it's an offensive game now. I think the offense wins this game. And 66 is a big number for me in this one because of Arkansas's lack of ability to put up, you know, getting some sort of a shootout with Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss wins this one, and I'll take the under total. Lock unity. Buddy. There we I'm go. Right there with you. But in all seriousness, get your popcorn ready. I do feel like Arkansas's defense got a little exposed too. The other thing is they've been through a gauntlet mm -hmm. of teams. When you think about Texas, the Texas A&M, the Alabama, they look tired. They look beat up at times. KJ Jefferson didn't have the same type of pop. Uh, they obviously had a hard time throwing the football. That's never really been their MO outside of some chunks and big plays. Uh, so I think they're going to have a hard time in this one because I think Ole Miss will get up early. They'll start to kind of run away with this, and, and then it's, it's going to be hard for them to play catch-up. So I'm going to lay the six and a half points here. I do see Ole Miss scoring a lot more than Arkansas on this one. Uh, so I like the under, and I think Arkansas will, will try to eat up some of that clock by running the football, eating up the time of possession, but it's not going to be effective. I like the lock unity. I can feel confident about uh, putting some money on that game. Let's talk about the next one. LSU at Kentucky, of course, Kentucky coming off that win against Florida. So we were talking to Chip Patterson earlier, and he feels like this is a must win for LSU, not just for them, but for Ed Orgeron, trying to keep his job there. Uh, Kentucky is favored by three. The total here is 51. What do you think, Brady? 35 years since Kentucky beat Florida, right? That, that was the step. I mean, that's a huge yeah. win. It's a huge win for this program. I worry about a bit of a letdown. I do. Like, I, I just, I feel like this is that, I don't want to call it a trap game because usually that's when you're looking ahead. This is one of those after you just went through a big time win, a physical battle uh, versus Florida. And then you got to line up again and do it against LSU. Uh, and so I'll take the three points here. I don't feel great about it. Uh, I do think this game will end up hitting the over. I think both offenses will be effective enough. But I just I worry about that letdown for Kentucky after the way he, they celebrated. I mean, what, they got fined $250,000 for storming the field. I mean, find a booster to write that one off. Come on, let these kids celebrate. But Max Johnson, Bouette, too, on the outside of their big play receiver. I think it's going to be tough for Kentucky to match up with some of the playmakers for LSU. So I look at this LSU team. I think they're in a massive dilemma too. Like Kentucky, I do agree with you, hangover, but they're also, there's gotta be an incredible amount of, of excitement in Kentucky. They're five and zero for the first time in 70 years. Like they're off to this incredible start. Ed Ogeron's talking about his job and he's taking it on him and I know he's starting to feel the pressure. But I look at LSU, I'm like, who is this team? This is a team <laughs> that used to run the football they're atrocious running the football. They used to play outstanding defense, run the football, ball control. Now they don't play any defense, and they sling the ball over the, all over the yard with Max Johnson, who is probably the one bright spot of the season for the LSU Tigers. I wonder where they are mentally, Brady. That's the thing I worry about LSU. I know it's a must-win game. I know it is for Ed Ogeron. Last year, this team shut it down. When they, like when they, I should take that back. They went to games. It was three and five early. They salvaged the season with kind of a miraculous win with a toss shoe in Gainesville uh, to beat the Gators and salvage the season. I just wonder where they are. I think Kentucky's playing with a tremendous amount of confidence by Will Levis, Christopher Rodriguez running the football. I think I think Kentucky might be pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and take them and lay the three. But I think where we're both in the same place is on the total because yeah. uh, I'm going to take the over. I think like LSU not playing any defense. Like, I think LSU will be able to run the football to have some success. And I think Max Johnson can put some points up on Kentucky. I, I do wonder about Wandale Robinson, him kind of be the X factor to what that could look like versus LSU's defense. But it, the reality is for me, I, I think this is where LSU at Ogeron kind of start to step up. They feel some of that pressure. As you talked about, Kentucky's never really been here. Like, do they know how to act? Do they know how to handle it? <laughs> Are they kind of puffing their chest around campus right now there in Lexington? I, I don't know, but that's more my concern. So I'll gladly take 
the three points because I think these teams are a lot more even than maybe the record shows. LSU 6-6 six and six since winning the national championship when it comes mm. to SEC games. So a lot to prove there. All right, Florida lost, uh, but they are favored big time in this game here against Vanderbilt. They won 29 of their past 30 matchups against Vandy. They're favored by 38 here. 59 and a hook is the total. Danny, what's your play in this game? All right, so I'm going to show you a little peek behind the curtain. Oh, these okay. We got notes. that finally. These, these are my notes. Red so pen. all throughout there, like you can see them, and then there's a blank spot. Do you see the yeah. blank spot? It's nothing new. <laughs> That's the that's the that's the Florida Vanderbilt one. I don't need any notes on that one. I watched Vanderbilt squeak one out against UConn this past weekend. Aww. I saw them get beat 23 to three against East Tennessee State. Vanderbilt is not. A, they're gonna be good because they got our guy Bart and Simmons there evaluating talent. They're right. gonna be good. That's right. They're just not very good right now. I think Florida lets out a little frustration, vents a little bit. I think they're going to run all over them. Uh, that's the one thing that, it, like, longer term with Florida, if they want to beat Georgia, they've got to – I think they need to start working Anthony Richardson in, get Thank a little you. bit more balance. I think Anthony Richardson is the guy of the future. But right now, I think, I think Florida just runs all over Vanderbilt. I didn't tackle the total because it scares me. I don't know if Vanderbilt's going to score any points. And Florida typically doesn't just put up 70 on their own or 60. I, so I stay away from the total, but I think Florida is going to blow through them. I think they're going to blow through them as well. <laughs> first off, congrats to Vanderbilt getting their first win because uh, this one's going to be rough. Yeah. This will be a rough game. I'm with you, though, with Anthony Richardson. I don't really understand really why Dan Bowen is, is so infatuated with Emory Jones out there. And it's not a knock on Emory Jones. It's just I think his ceiling is limited, and I think that limitation – keeps their offense back from being able to do more in the passing game and then starting a player who's younger who's got more of an opportunity within your program to grow from these experiences so look this Florida Gators defense is going to get after Vanderbilt I don't know that they'll put up any points in this one uh, and I think Florida not only will run all over them I think you're going to see a heavy dose of, dose of Anthony Richardson and I think you're going to see some of those big plays in the passing game come from it too when he's in there him and probably Emory Jones for that matter because they're both going to play a lot they're going to put up a lot of points so if, uh, Florida in the over if Jack our producer wants to put us in lock unity he can throw the over on there I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't have any notes on that one so but I'll go ahead and throw the over you can talk to me into it <laughs> all right well then we'll recap their picks here so you can take a look at it and we'll make an edit later on saying we have two lock unities out of this one both like Ole Miss and the under and then we'll both take uh, Florida to cover the 38 and Danny going to throw the over in there as well. They both also like the over in LSU, Kentucky. So it's been a pretty easy road for Ohio State the past couple of games. Can they cover the 21 against Maryland? And what is up with the line when it comes to Michigan at Nebraska? We'll take a look at that next. Welcome back into CBS Sports HQ, getting you ready for week six in college football, taking a look at some Big Ten ranked games we've got coming up. Maryland at Ohio State. Uh, Ohio State's had a pretty easy road. They have won each of their past three games by at least 20 points. Michigan at Nebraska, we'll get into that. And it's a rival, or excuse me, a revenge game for Michigan State at Rutgers. Of course, Rutgers beating Michigan State last season, snapping their six-game winning streak. I do want to know when it comes to the rivalry or uh, Brooks and Bryson. I want to know who's going to be right? the athlete, right? I know. That's what they've been doing. The interesting thing about this matchup, though, at least just talking golf, is the pace of play issue. Like, that plays right into Bryson's hand because yeah. they're playing together. So he can play as slow as he wants. It's going to be ticking off Brooks Kepka. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I think they should put me with Kepka, Florida State guys. Okay, that makes and sense. And then you get two nerds like Brady and Bryson with uh, your glasses. I was going to say two, two, two more beefcakes. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Like that is out. true. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Could be on to something. Can you pitch it? I uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So taking a look at the Big Ten ranked games we have got coming up here. We've got Maryland at Ohio State. Ohio State, the big favorite here by 21. We'll see if they can cover that. Michigan, Nebraska, and then Michigan State at Rutgers. Uh, the Spartans looking for revenge after Rutgers beat them last season, snapping a six-game winning streak there. Welcome back in Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell. I'm Amanda Garris. We get Maryland at Ohio State. Maryland has never beaten Ohio State. Ohio State, the big favorite there by 21. Total here, it's a big one, 69. What do you think about that? Uh, well, they're, look, they're expecting a lot of scoring in this one. I don't think we're going to get that much scoring only because Maryland lost their best wide receiver, Dante Demas, for the rest of the season. So it's unfortunate. Rakeem Jarrett will have to step up into that spot. 
Uh, but I, I think Maryland got a, a little bit exposed on, on Friday night versus Iowa. Talia Tungvaluwa struggled taking care of the football. Really, their offense did in general. Seven turnovers on total. And look, this Ohio State team has improved. I think we all kind of wrote them off after that early loss to Oregon. Defensively, they're mixing in more split safety zone, more zone covers, not as predictable. Offensively, they're finally getting back the to running the football. So I'm going to go ahead and lay the 21 points here. I do think it hits the under, and it's more about Maryland just not being able to put up enough for Ohio State, and Ohio State kind of blowing the doors off the way their offense is played. You are not allowed to improve in college football. It's you're done with the playoffs, your first loss, you're done. Remember, that was the, hey, Ohio State, boy, they can't lose to Oregon and get pushed around with that. They changed defensive philosophy. Kerry Combs, you know, they, now they're having other guys chip in on the, on the defensive game plan, and it is working. They are getting better. They're still a work in progress, yeah. clearly. The offense, C.J. Stroud, do not forget about him. Five touchdown passes last week. Travion Henderson, all of a sudden, starting to get, you know, get things going. The five-star true freshman is lighting things up. I think they have a field goal. They're 6-0 and against Maryland since Maryland's been in the Big Ten. The average margin of victory is 36. So I go ahead and lay the three touchdowns to Ohio State. I don't sweat that at all. The only reason I'm differing on the total on this one is from what we saw from Talia Tongavaloa, he will keep chucking it. Like, he will keep – so this to me has backdoor because I think – you could see Ohio State score well over 50, and then late in the game, I still think you'll see Talia throwing it all over, and I think you could put up some late points against Ohio State's defense. So that's the only thing I would differ on. You were saying, I'm, this one makes me a little bit nervous. That number is pretty big, but I think it's one of those la late backdoor cover type situations. Really Ohio State's running the football, too. That's what concerns yeah. me. They get in the second half of these games, they might just say, hey, we're running this thing out. And it's they got so many guys. Seven and a half times, something like that. They got so many guys to keep happy, though. Like, they want to make sure Chris Olave gets his and Garrett Wilson gets well, his. Well, that's first half. <laughs> right. that, that's first yes. half of Ohio State football. Yeah. Second half, different story. Yeah. Uh, this next one's a little interesting. We get number nine Michigan at unranked Nebraska. Michigan only a three-point favorite in this game, though. Of course, coming off that win against Wisconsin, uh, Nebraska blowing out Northwestern 56-7. The total here is 52. Brady, what do you think about this game? Uh, I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I think Nebraska has been underrated in regards to how much they've improved defensively because the record doesn't necessarily show it, and they don't do anything necessarily offensively flashy. Uh, so I, I think they'll be able to hang in this game a little bit because Michigan has found their identity. They want to run the football. They want to control the game, play good defense. And I get that. They've recruited to that. They can develop to that. It's worked for them. But the real thing I think I saw last week for Michigan was the step that Cade McNamara took. You know, he was able to go in there, throw more than he's thrown the entire season, and was able to make some big throws and some big plays. I still have some questions, though. I, I really do as far as his ability to ultimately lead them versus the top of the Big Ten East, whether you're talking Penn State or Ohio State. Nebraska is not necessarily that, but this line looks fishy to me. I'm going to go ahead and lay the three points. I think the under is the better play between this two, uh, but, but obviously I'm on the side of Michigan right now. Jim Harbaugh's got him in a good spot moving forward. You know, last week the Wisconsin line was fishy, and I tried to follow the fishermen, I guess, and like say, <laughs> or the fish. I don't know which side I followed, but I was like, oh, let me get cute and take Wisconsin. Even though I thought Michigan was better, so for that reason, I, I hate this game. Like now I see this line, I'm like, oh, just stay away from it. But I'm the same, uh, same page as you, Brady, with taking the under. I think you're going to – Adrian Martinez has been better, but he's by no means going to light things up. Cade McNamara has been better. His highest you know, yardage total of the year, getting almost to 200 yards, which is really pretty crazy, 197. We're like, ooh, that's a big game when we routinely see guys go over 350 yards. But that's what they are. That's what they want to be. And they have a very clear identity at Michigan – probably for this first time since they hired Josh Gaddis. But then they bring in their offensive line coach. He's co-offensive coordinator. And we're kind of seeing a reversion to what Jim Harbaugh brought there his first year into at Michigan when they had their most success. So I'll tell you what, Jack, give me some lock unity. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm with Brady on this Yeah. One. Give me Michigan. Lay the points. This one's a, like Nebraska. They've been getting better. But at some point, maybe Michigan's just good, and they're trending to be in that 10-win team that we saw three times already in the Jim Harbaugh era. I mean, that front is just tough. That front seven for Michigan is tough to run against. They've got their own running game going. You know, they got some playmakers, too, on the outside, which I think will be a tough matchup for Nebraska. But uh, could this be the year for Michigan? I mean, that's what I'm more curious to see. In the past, this was that, that like, road bump that I'd be worried about. I, I, I guess I'm a little worried just because I thought this line would be bigger. Yeah, I, I didn't too. think it would be just three points. That's what concerns me here. But they are playing in Lincoln. Uh, they're going to have to redo all these full screens just because. It is <laughs> all right, let's move on. Here we get number 11, Michigan State at Rutgers. Michigan State had won six in a row last year when Rutgers came in and upset them. Uh, they're favored by five here at the total 51 and a hook. Danny, what's your play? 
Uh, Mel Tucker's done an outstanding job. Kenneth Walker III is lighting people up. You know, we've given a lot of running backs love on this show who are way more of household names, whether it's B. John Robinson or Travion Henderson, but Kenneth Walker III is actually leading the country, aided in part because of a 250-yard performance against the Miami Hurricanes. But they've also got an outstanding quarterback, and this to me is more about Rutgers. I think Rutgers will present a challenge for a bit, but the fact that last year, you had Michigan State get beat in this game. I think has them tuned up. I think they want to let out some frustration against them. So I'm going to go ahead and take Sparty in this one. Rutgers, Noah Vidral, their quarterback. I don't know. I just, I'm not buying in. I'm not sold on him. They got schooled last week against Ohio State. I think, you know, I don't think you're going to see that much of a beatdown, but I'm going to go ahead and take them here in this spot. Uh, and I'm also going to take the over because I think Michigan State scores a lot of points against this defense, similar to what you saw uh, last week against Ohio State. I'm with you on that. My concern is what you see that Rutgers lost last week, 13 points. I, I think that'll probably be about what they scored. This, I actually think Michigan State has a better defense than Ohio State. So that's a much greater challenge for a Rutgers team that outside of Pacheco doesn't have many playmakers on offense and they couldn't get him going last week. So that's a concern there is how much Rutgers is going to be able to score on this one. I like the under. I'm going to lay the five points here with Michigan State. And, and as much as it's about last year, I also think it's about this year. This is a really good football team. Kenneth Walker to me has been the best running back in the country this year that no one's talking about. Peyton Thorne's a good decision maker. Uh, he very rarely turns the football over. And they've got playmakers on the outside too. So even offensively, I think you've got to be more bullish about where this team is at right now. So I'll lay the five points. I know it's up in Piscataway and I might be a little bit sleepy with where Rutgers Birthplace is at. of football. That's right. Uh, and I, I think Michigan State's going to get back to the birthplace of football with running all game long with Kenneth Walker. So uh, under and then I'll lay the five. Recapping your picks here, I had written down no lock unity, but that is now a lie because Danny <laughs> likes to add on. Look, they got it in there, though. There Danny. we go. Both going quick. with Michigan and the under there. They both like Ohio State to cover the 21, and they're both going with Sparty to cover the five at Rutgers. Coming up after losing to Cincinnati, it's basically a pick em now for Notre Dame at Virginia. We'll see what the guys say about that. And can Cincinnati cover the 29 against Temple next? Continuing to get our expert picks here on CBS Sports HQ Week 6 College Football. We get Notre Dame going up against Virginia Tech. Interesting note here, Brady Quinn, Mr. Fighting Irish. Uh, Notre Dame has won 35 straight games versus unranked opponents. The last time they did lose was to Virginia Tech back in 2016. We'll see if that plays in to your picks. Why he... I mean, uh, what, 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 everyone makes a big deal about statistics. history. No, because it, what does it have to do with this matchup, this team, the, this person? Hey, because that. it's fun. Get out of here. If, little notes in your head. It's if cute, you whatever. don't learn from your history, you're bound to repeat you're bound it. To repeat it. Yeah, he, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So for that, even <laughs> yes. though we get Mr. Fighting Irish here, you get to yes. first pick. Yes, that was pick. my first note too, Amanda. I was the same page as you. Thank you. I All appreciate right. it. It's Blacksburg. Pick Go ahead. Blacksburg. One of the toughest environments in the game. I love it. I love this matchup. I think this game is going to be really compelling. The odds makers think so too. Could come to, could come down to the wire. I'm going to go with Virginia Tech because they're healthy. Like I, I Notre Dame's been through. They've been in battle tested. They've been in these tight games. But now we're starting to see it take its toll. The offensive line has been struggling mightily, but now we've seen D uh, Jack Cohn knocked out a game. We saw Michael Merritt go out there, you know, hobbling around in the fourth quarter of the last game against Cincinnati. The second half, trying to figure out a way just to make it happen. This offensive line, though, I think has been a massive problem and it's starting to try to reveal itself in some of the numbers. They're 127th in yards per carry, 126th in sacks allowed, and 129th in tackles for loss allowed. Meanwhile, Virginia Tech, they're 11th in scoring defense. They're a pretty good defense. So I actually favor the Hokies in here. I didn't love either side on this one, but I do like the under in this one because I don't think Virginia Tech is an offense with Braxton Burmeister that's going to be just putting up massive points out there. So give me the Hokies and the under in this one. So actually, Notre Dame's offensive line is getting healthier. Carmody came back and left tackle last week. A little bit different game plan to go up against Cincinnati's defense. Uh, but, but the biggest thing for Notre Dame right now is who's the quarterback going to be? Mm -hmm. You know, you saw Jack Cohn. He eventually got benched. They put in Drew Pine. We saw Tyler Buckner for a minute. Both Cohn Buckner had just you know, knee, knee breaking interceptions that really hurt you. Turnovers was the name of what I think happened to Notre Dame last week as far as kind of spelling their demise. But it looks like Drew Pine gives this team the best spark. And you saw it versus Wisconsin. It came in the game when Jack Cohn got hurt when you referenced that, gave them a spark. You even saw that last week versus Cincinnati, started to move the football, giving them a spark. 
They haven't talked about who it's going to be. This isn't the NFL. They don't have to necessarily announce that, but I would be kind of a surprise if Pine wasn't the player. He gives them a spark. He's more mobile. He knows the system. He's been there now for a while. So uh, that's going to be the biggest question they need to answer. And then from there, look, they've got the playmakers. But Kevin Austin, he needs to step up. He needs to make plays when they're out there for him. We know they can rely on Mike Mayer, but if they can distribute the football and have someone there who's a little bit more mobile where they aren't taking negative plays like Jack Cohn's taken, I think they've got a much better shot in this one. So it's, it, I'm only laying a point here with Notre Dame on the road. I think they get back on track. I think one of the things that's been undermined was how well Notre Dame's defense played. I mean, let's not forget, a couple of turnovers by the quarterbacks, a fumbled kickoff return to put their defense in a bad spot. Still held Cincinnati, what, 24? I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they've improved a lot more than I think people realize. Virginia Tech, to me, is very one-dimensional. If you could stop them running the football, Notre Dame's going to have a time making some plays against that defense that you talked about. And also, the ACC is just down this year. I mean, we're, we're talking about that now. You've got the highest-ranked team is, what, Wake Forest at 19? Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if, if they should be ranked there. So I'll lay the point here with Notre Dame, and I've got the over on this one. I think you're going to see some scoring in this game. Uh, let's go to the next one, number 19, Wake Forest at Syracuse. Danny, Wake Forest, only team, ACC still undefeated, 5-0 and here. They're getting 6.5 to total 65 and a hook. What do you think? See, I take exception to the ACC as garbage. Yeah, you do. Where do you do? We're, I, I, didn't, I didn't say garbage. Those are your words, by the way. <laughs> we're, right? We're, maybe you it's said subliminal. garbage. Maybe it's subliminal. <laughs> but we're deep. I've always heard for a long time, other conferences, they bang each other around, yeah, and then it's yeah. just, you know, the oh, is that what the ACC is? Yeah. Yes, but Wake Forest is the last team standing, even though, according to a lot of analytics, Pitt has the best chance to make the playoffs from the ACC. Wake Forest schedule hasn't exactly been tough yet, but I do like Sam Hartman, former star of QB1, the Netflix series, at the quarterback position. I, the thing that I kind of makes me nervous is against Louisville playing, they didn't have that an impressive a showing, but Syracuse, banged up against a, just a physical battle of going to Tallahassee and losing to the Florida State Seminoles. Like, you, you might get beat twice by Florida State. They're that good. I am worried about where Syracuse is. In all seriousness, one of Syracuse's best wideouts who was benched uh, was all ACC last year, actually announced he was transferring today. I wonder where Syracuse is mentally after a little bit of a rough start for the season. Coming after that loss late to Florida State, who was 0 for on the season, I think Wake is playing with a lot of confidence. I think they're going to carry that torch for the ACC one more week and remain undefeated and cover in this game. And uh, who did I have on the total on this one? I had a total. The on over. This one. I had the, the over, over as well. Because I think I think <laughs> so. So Dino Babers, Garrett Schrader, they like to go fast. They like yep. to get a lot of possessions. Yep, I think they'll be able to score some touchdowns too. But but Garrett Schrader is their entire offense in Syracuse. I mean that's kind of the kind of concern I have right now because Wake Forest defense is good enough I think to stop a dual threat quarterback like Schrader, especially if they're limited on playmakers on the outside. Sam Harbin, what was the end again? What was the star of the game? QB1, yeah. Netflix series. Yeah, <laughs> you got to go watch those, man. I love how you brought that up. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's been making some big plays down the field. He's playing, I would say, next to Kenny Pickett, some of the best football quarterback, even though Sam Howell's kind of turned, turned the switch back on as the season's gone on. But I, I'm going to lay the six and a half points here. I think a low scoring game. I see Wake scoring more than Syracuse in this one, but uh, I'll lay the six and a half. Cincinnati now up to number five. First time they've been in the top five since 2009. They are hosting Temple. Uh, big favorite here for Cincy. They're favored by almost 30 points, 29 to be exact. The total here is 54. Danny, what's your play? This is a hangover game for me. Oh. Like, this is so a Cincinnati. Hangover. A lot of hangover. They All had the two games circled, Indiana and Notre Dame. And if you <laughs> watch the way Indiana played early, it was all chips were in on the Notre Dame game. Emotional. Luke Fickle, this squad, Desmond Ritter has the game of the year, like for his, uh, for so far this season. Everyone's talking about them. This is a coach's nightmare for me. Meanwhile, Temple, I don't, they're not going to come close to beating them, but this number is way too big here for me. But I do think Dwan Mathis, the transfer from Georgia, could have some success late in this game. This to me is all about them being emotionally drained, going on the road, coming back home to Nippert. I just think they'll be feeling good about themselves. Temple's not bad either. They did beat Memphis, who beat Mississippi State. So I think they'll make a game of it. I just worry about some of this wild college football season. Just don't lay too big of an egg if you're Cincinnati. I am on the exact opposite. Oh, side boy. Give me the under, too, are. because when you're hungover, you're struggling <laughs> on all sides of the ball. Jeez. You're struggling. No, you this need to is, talk about your college days <laughs> at some point down the line. This is the opportunity to strike. You did it. You went to South Bend. You had the biggest victory in your program's history. You are now in striking distance of the playoff, and you should move up because there's going to be a loser between Iowa and Penn State. Mm. So it's Cincinnati. I'm laying the points. 
I think they're going to lay the hammer down to Temple, so I love the over in this one. No, no, you've, you've got this all wrong. This is their opportunity now to prove it, that they should be a part of the playoff, and they start blowing the doors off everyone moving forward. That's what they need to do. And if I'm Luke Fickle, I'm selling them That's on that message because the Indiana win isn't as impressive as it looked at the start of the season. So they need style points. Yeah. I have a note from producer Jack for you that the AAC has as many ranked teams as the ACC right <laughs> I now. Take a shot. <laughs> yeah, from the control room, we got it for yeah. you. All right, let's talk about number 24 SMU at Navy here. Uh, I am from Dallas. I feel very bad. I did not realize that the Mustangs were still undefeated, but they are. They're going to be boulevarding. That is their tailgate there. Mustangs favored by 13 and a hook. The total here, 56. What you think? I know we're up against the break. I'll be quick. Uh, Tana Mordecai, oh, the no, passing we're attack. Now. Okay, well, <laughs> either way, Tana Mordecai, the passing attack. I'll lay the 13 and a half points. Not the same Navy team that we've seen in the past. So I think SMU will put up a decent amount of points in this one to hit that over. Ken Niamatolo, the head coach of Navy, is 8 and 2 straight up against SMU. They beat UCF last week, but SMU is going to roll. SMU is really good. Tana Mordecai, 24, I just set it up just for the drama. 24 <laughs> touchdowns. It's the best passing attack. By the way, SMU's offensive coordinator, Garrett Riley, Lincoln yep. Riley's brother, yep. doing a sensational job. So, yeah, I think they roll against Navy. All right, Sanford at Arizona State. Uh, Arizona State, the favorite here by 11 and a half, the total 51 and a hook. Danny? Uh, I went with Stanford in this one. I think they're playing with a lot of confidence. Tanner McKee, since he's been inserted as the starter, has been playing fantastic. It was a little bit of a bumpy ride last week in a very tough game against Oregon. But he, took, he got drilled, came back in, still found a way to win that game. This, to me, is too many points against an Arizona State team and a Pac-12, which I think uh, there are a lot of good teams. I'm struggling to find who the great team is. Do I trust Arizona State to lay 11 and a half? Not quite yet, so give me the Cardinal. I'm on the other side of this one. I'm a little bit concerned about that physical toll that matchup took versus Oregon last week. Two very physical teams, Oregon, Stanford. So uh, that concerns me moving into this week. Arizona State at home. Jaden Daniels has gotten better playing from the pocket, even though we're showing you a rushing highlight, which plays to his strengths with that rushing attack. I just think Stanford's going to be outmatched. I think they're coming back at home. This was the line, too, that was fished to me, Danny. I didn't think it should be this many points, especially after Stanford upsetting Oregon last week. So. Something tells me maybe I'm a fish, maybe I'm taking the bait here. I'm laying the 11 and a half, but I do think we're going to hit that over. I think Arizona State's going to score a decent amount, and you mentioned Tanner McKee. 11 touchdowns, no picks so far. They'll do some scoring as well in this one. I think you've been hanging out too much with Prisco. He improbably that pick. Un unfortunately, <laughs> yes, right. exactly. That happens sometimes. All right, let's recap their picks here. Not a whole lot of agreement in this one. I'll tell you two places they do agree, both like Wake Forest and SMU to cover. All right, we've got a couple more games to go through here. Let's start with Boise State at BYU. BYU the favorite at home with five. The total here is 55. Brady, what's your play? Tough place to play for uh, for Boise too. And I think this BYU team feels like they're kind of destined maybe for making a run or making a case at least for the college football playoffs sitting there at number 10 right now. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and lay the points here. I'm also going to take the over. I think both these offenses can't score. Don't sleep on Hank Bachmeyer. Tyler Algier, the running back for uh, BYU, is pretty special. Had over 200 yards last week in a pretty tight game against Utah State. Quarterback is an issue. They've had a bunch of injur injuries, but Baylor Romney, I think, will be back from a head injury. Uh, and Jaron Hall, I think, will be available, so I don't worry about that. BYU quietly. We talk about Cincinnati chasing the playoff. Uh, BYU has a better opportunity with a schedule where there's a bunch of Power 5. They already have three wins over Pac-12 teams. So give me BYU. I'll take the over. Hank Bachmeyer can sling it. I think he'll yeah. put up some points against BYU, but I'll lay the points with BYU as well. BYU now ranked 10th which is very impressive. All right, Coastal Carolina ranked 15th, still undefeated, Danny. Your Coastal Carolina team going up against Arkansas State. Uh, they're favored by 19, Coastal Carolina. The total here is huge, though, 71 and a half. What do you think? Lay the points, don't even sweat it. Grayson McCall is having a year, and this is the second year. He's doing this back-to-back. -back. Last year, they had that incredible run. 80% completion percentage. He's averaging 12.9 pass yards per game. His, pass, his efficiency rating is 224. All of those would be FBS records if he can finish the season. I don't think he will. It just speaks to how flawless he's playing the position. I think this is one of those games they could put up close to 60. I think Arkansas State could put up a couple touchdowns against them. So I'll take the over. Uh, that over under is kind of high to me. It I like the high. under on this one, but I'm with you with Coastal Carolina. You, you're hard pressed to find a quarterback playing better than Grace McCall. That defense too is stingy. So Arkansas State is going to have a hard time scoring many points. All right, New Mexico at San Diego State. San Diego State making their debut into the top 25 this week. Congratulations to the Aztecs here. A uh, big favorite at home though, 19 and a half. The total here, 42 and a half. Brady, what's your play? San Diego State is going to run away with this one. Literally, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and lay the 19 and a half points the ball. here. They love to run the football. They're one of the best rushing teams 
in the FBS. Uh, even though there's some familiarity here in New Mexico, their defense coordinator was former head coach at San Diego State, so there's that. Uh, but I also like the under here. I think short game, low scoring game, lay the points. Totally agree with both of them. Uh, Brady Hoke has done an outstanding job kind of picking up where Rocky Long left off. They wanted to run the football. He's taking over. They run it more than anybody that's not a triple option team. They just keep handing it off to the backs. Uh, New Mexico, they started off pretty strong, but then they've lost three games. In those three games, they've only scored 23 points. So I think San Diego State will have some success defensively again, too. So I'll take the under, too. Lock agreement. I was trying to give you faith yesterday about Austin Eckler. Told you about a running back who went out for 20 minutes, came back in, two rushing touchdowns. Greg Bell, San Diego State. Mm. Uh, all right, let's look at their recapping their picks here from this last particular block. Boise. A lot of unity. At BYU. Almost perfect block unity. Let's go. Okay, yes, very close there. Uh, only disagree in the total when it comes to Coastal Carolina at Arkansas State. So speaking of block unity, I don't know the number because Danny decided to change a couple of his <laughs> Look picks. at all those. What is that? One, two, three, six. six. Count the screen. Six. You know, <laughs> counting is hard sometimes, Brady Quinn. Danny's taking a picture. There's the confetti. There's your there confetti. Congratulations. So if you guys want to uh, put some money on any of these games, those would be the ones to do it. There Danny we go. Now, Brady Quinn, Amanda Guerra. Now we have 20 seconds. Oh, we see, we went fast. I know, now right? Three seconds to chat. Go. I have nothing more to say. There this you be a great Where are you going this weekend? Football? Air Force? Uh, Wyoming at Air Force. Yeah, there you Wyoming go. undefeated. Go. Conference opener, it'll be fun. AG. Want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis. No yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.